Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Well, this has been a pretty wild month for all of us, hasn't it? For the last five weeks or so, I've only left the borders of our immediate neighborhood a couple of times. Once a couple of weeks ago to go grocery shopping in person. And once the day before the governor restricted us to our homes a few weeks ago for a drive with our windows up through a local neighborhood with hundreds of blooming cherry trees. Here in the Washington, D.C. area, seeing the cherry trees bloom downtown is an annual celebration, one most of us chose to forego this year. Getting to go to an alternate blossom site and do a drive-by sighting was a nice substitution, given the current global situation. My spouse David has been working from home for five or maybe six weeks now, I think. Our college-aged son and his international girlfriend were evicted from their dorm rooms and came here to join us right afterwards. Although having a full house all day, every day, is a very new experience, I admit it's usually been pretty wonderful. All four of us have desks set up in different rooms where David can work and the kids can zoom into their classes and do their studying and writing. We usually come together off and on, sometimes for breakfast or lunch, always for dinner, and sometimes for board games or jigsaw puzzles or theater on demand. I was thrilled to see Tilly over at Tilly's Shelf talk about the performances from the National Theater. David and I both especially enjoyed a stage production of Jane Eyre streaming on YouTube by the National Theater, a fascinating staging that in some ways echoes some of the ideas of Shakespeare's original staging choices, like using a small set of actors to play a larger set of characters, using a relatively limited stage set and replacing fancy sets with imagination, having a trapdoor exit in the middle, performing music on stage, etc. Tilly's discussion of the impact of some of the character doubling choices is really interesting. I'll leave a link to her video below. Did any of the rest of you see it either live when it was mounted a few years ago or this past week? Right before we started our Passover celebration last week, we had a birthday party. My son's girlfriend turned 21, and he will turn 21 at the end of the month. During a previous visit, she introduced us to one of her favorite flavors, elderflower, and I scraped together some of the flour we still had in the pantry to make a small citrus elderflower birthday cake. Since she's a classics major, studying Latin and Greek literature, we thought these Roman numeral candles would be perfect. I've also spent some time on other crafty hobbies. First, I've been knitting, and I'm nearing the end of a warm, multicolored shawl that I hope to finish before the temperatures start to rise here in the D.C. area. I don't think I would be able to stand all that wool sitting in my lap once we hit the 80s or so here, Fahrenheit. I've also done a bit of sewing. My state requires that people wear masks when at the grocery store or at the pharmacy. And we've been seeing great examples all over town and all over the internet. I'm especially fond of this one. Despite how lovely and appropriate it is, I think cloth might be a better fitting option. I'm not a sewer at all, but my son, a young man with a deep understanding of how to make things work, any things, out of almost any medium, coached me through the first one. Here's the first one he made as an initial sample. One thing that has surprised me is that my spouse and I have, in general, watched less Netflix or Prime or PBS Passport, perhaps because we have a full house now, or perhaps because at least I am needing a lot more sleep than usual to make up for the time I still spend awake and panicking in the middle of the night. Things always seem better by the morning, but by then I'm yawning. Unexpectedly, I've also fallen way behind watching booktube videos. 
One of the reasons is that I'm worried our internet might not be happy with four people streaming video. Another is that when I put something on, on my phone as I lie in bed before going to sleep, I fall asleep. I wake up later with my earbuds still in and having missed all but the first few minutes of the video. Matthew's reading of Winnie the Pooh over at Mayberry Book Club was perfect for this, and I suppose actually part of his intention. Go back and listen if you miss them. When I watch videos most, it sometimes seems, is during those middle-of-the-night panic sessions. But audiobooks seem to be a better sleep-inducing choice. I think I might try to download Proust or something, especially if there's a soporific reader for just that purpose. Any other recommendations? Although, like many of you, my reading slowed down a lot this month, I'm starting to find a path again. I mentioned before that nonfiction was working better for me than fiction, but I think I'm beginning to relax back into novels, at least short ones. This month I'm reading a few books with other readers, and I've been enjoying some personal choices as well. I'll catch you up on what I've read and what I think about those books in an upcoming video, maybe next week. But today, I want to share with you a little book haul of books I haven't started reading yet and don't have on my immediate docket. Most are books I picked up at my local library the morning before it closed its doors for the duration of the plague. A few are from the Friends of the Library book sale cards, and a few from neighborhood little free libraries, ones that always serve me well, and a couple I bought from online used book sources or bought new. So let's look through them. Well, let me start with two books I found at the Friends of the Library sale card. First is The Mitford Murders by Jessica Fellows, daughter of Julian Fellows, creator of Downton Abbey. I think I first heard about it on Steve Donahue's channel, and it sounds like it will be a great distraction at some point. I love the idea of taking interesting historical characters, especially authors, or taking literary characters and reanimating them, putting them in contemporary mystery novels as detectives. The idea of letting feisty Nancy Mitford solve the murder sounds like fun. I've heard through the grapevine that there's a similar kind of book about the Bronte sisters, and I think I'm going to have to check that one out, perhaps during the upcoming Victober. The other book I found in the Friends cart was also a book to recommendation. I believe from Lukash at Totally Pretentious, as well as Brianna at Brianna's Library, who's doing an exciting channel refresh at the moment. And that recommended book is Blues People, Negro Music in White America by Leroy Jones, later known as Amiri Baraka. He explains in the introduction that while he started the book as a history of the music, he wound up writing the history of the African American people because the blues were not only central to the black community, but served as a metaphor for what he calls the creative orchestration of black life and culture at large. So, on to a few books I checked out at the library, and will have to return at some point, although not until my county opens up again following the pandemic. First, I found Annie Dillard's collection of essays, The Abundance. Sarah at Hardcover Hearts was blown away by the first essay in the collection, and while it doesn't seem she was quite as astonished about the book as a whole, if I'm remembering correctly from her follow-up, I was eager to try out at least that first one. And a blurb from the back cover made me think this might be the right time, given some of the other things I'm reading this month. Edmund White calls Dillard as observant as Thoreau, as thoughtful as Emerson, as all-embracing as Whitman. I'll mention the book again when I discuss the books about those authors, which I'm reading right now. I hadn't realized that Dillard's book and the next book had anything to do with each other when I first picked them up. That book is Penelope Lively's Life in the Garden. But I suppose both books speak to the need to think about a larger natural world, 
as well as a larger imaginative world of the mind, both teeming with new growth. Lively's book chronicles her own gardens, those she grew up exploring and those she tended, as well as the gardens of literature. It sounds quiet and peaceful, but also very much alive. I picked up a bunch of other books at the library, which you might see appearing on my reading wrap-ups in the coming months. And on my walk home from the public library, I peeked in one of those dollhouse little free libraries and was ecstatic to find a copy of Hermione Lee's biography of Edith Wharton. I'm afraid this is unlikely to be on my reading list anytime soon. Last month, I bagged on reading Lee's big biography of Virginia Woolf, and that one comes first, I think. Still, I'm thrilled to be able to put this one on my shelves. After my library shuttered its doors, I realized that I was really going to need a few books about pandemics. I already had a few on my shelves, but I ordered a used copy of Geraldine Brooks's Year of Wonders, a novel of the plague. I'd almost acquired it before, even before I read her wonderful novel March, about the father of Alcott's Little Women, just because the cover shows a woman wearing a headscarf. But the book seems like it might be an appropriate read right now, at least if I can get my courage up. The other pandemic book I'll mention is one I bought new, and had to wait a while for because it was in such enormous demand. John Barry's The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, a history of the so-called Spanish flu of 1918. I've read a bit about the 1918 flu before and about typhoid and yellow fever, tuberculosis, polio, etc., mostly because of my academic interest in the history of disability and illness. But I had not read this one, and it's an important account of the flu, especially in the United States. The book looks at the doctors and patients, as well as the government and the community at large. I'm reading it very slowly, maybe a chapter every few days, still a little shell-shocked by the comment on the book cover that says, is quote, a precise and sobering model as we confront the epidemics looming on our horizon. Perhaps I'll make a part two of this pandemic preparation book haul, or perhaps you'll just hear about what I actually get read from the rest of the stack. I'd love to hear about what you're finding to be the right books for the moment and what you've been doing to keep yourself grounded as much as you can. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for joining me today on Hannah's Books. See you soon.